Yep. So, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you guys are. So, this is our Geospatial Fellows webinar series. Um, we have been running this for a while, starting from uh, the spring and into the summer. My name is Anand Padmanabhan. I'm a research associate professor at the Department of Geography and Geographic Information Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I'd like to welcome all of you today. Um, today's talk is, um, is from Clio Andelis. Uh, Clio is an assistant professor in the School of um, City Regional Planning and uh, School of Interactive um, Computing at the Georgia Tech. Uh, she studies network systems, geographic systems, and directs the Friendly Cities uh, Lab. She has a prestigious NSF Research Career Award. And her work today is with her co-authors, um, um, her co-authors from the University of Iowa and UCLA. Today, we'll also have a discussion. John Michelle Goodman, who is a Professor Emeritus and uh, Academy Professor of the City and Regional Planning at the Ohio State University. He is a distinguished scholar who has mentored a numerous masters and PhD students and has many peer reviewed publications. His research interests focuses on uh, analysis, modeling of urban heat islands and its migration and its mitigation and the role of green infrastructure in urban sustainability air pollution for transportation and other sources of urban energy consumptions and land use change and dynamics. So the, semi, uh, the webinar today has two portions, I guess. The first one, uh, Cleo will be uh, giving her presentation and John uh, Michal will be uh, a discussant following her presentation. We'll hold our questions at, towards the end of the webinar um, series and uh, or the webinar uh, today and we'll have um, we'll take questions on the Q&A forum as well and in the end if there are lingering questions we'll uh, allow all of you to to raise your hands and maybe ask the questions as needed uh, i would also want to thank our colleagues here at AAG July T Colleen and Oscar who have been helping us and from the cyber GIS center side um, uh, Dr Shawan Wong who is the PI of the uh, Geospatial Software Institute project, which is hosting this webinar series, and Becky Wonderwally, who is a graduate student here. So without much ado, I'll pass on the floor to Cleo. Thank you, Cleo. Thanks, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I'm very excited to talk with you today. I was really, really excited to be a Geospatial Fellow, and uh, we've been getting together now for over for, it, it's not over a year, but it feels like almost a year on, on Mondays, and it's been great to have this wonderful family. So thank you all. Okay, I'm going to start my slideshow. And my talk today is called Building Effective Regions for COVID-19 Policy Administration from Networks of Human Movement and Social Ties. And this work is done with, in collaboration with Chalar Kolu and Mason Porter. And we are thrilled here to have uh, Jean-Michel Goldman as our discussant today. I will just say right now that I've been following his work for a long time, and he's one of the few planners that has looked at spatial communications, and it's a very important and understudied uh, element of planning. So I will go over an introduction, talk a little bit about regionalization, talk about our data and method, results and conclusions in our implementation. I'd also like to share that we have a blog post up. It's a little bit lengthy for a blog post, uh, and it is available at this link. And I think we were going to just go ahead and put that at the in the chat for everybody. So thank you so much if you wanted to follow along there. All right. So the main point I want to make today is that instead of states, we should use counties and county groups for decisions to reopen or to implement any type of policy, mask wearing policies, school openings or closures, business openings or closures, social distancing measures, et cetera, during COVID-19. 
So the goal of this region it, research is to find regions that perform better than states at quote containing. We can't really say containing very much because that would be a very strong ep epidemiological term, but we can say preventing spillovers of COVID-19. And we wanna capture natural networks of transmission so that we're not transmitting between regions, but that in the unfortunate event that the disease is present in a region, that it stays within that region and doesn't cross regions. The approach that we're using here is very multidisciplinary and it has a lot to do with big data and the concept of replicability that we've been talking a lot and has been a theme in the Geospatial Fellows Program. So we use networks of hundreds of millions of commutes, migrants, trips, GPS trips, and social network ties. And we apply community detection algorithms to cut the spatial network into little partitions. The result is a map of new districts that can preserve tight-knit communities and minimize transmission across communities. And our motivation for doing this is that states may not be the best unit ana of analysis for policies. Governors last year, we all got to learn the names of a lot of governors. Governor of Michigan, Governor of Florida, Governor of California, if you, had it, if you didn't know that beforehand, Governor of Georgia, they all sort of had a moment there in implementing these policies and being very, very political when they did so. Governor of South Dakota as well. But this is problematic. States are way too heterogeneous in terms of population density and in terms of their ideology, et cetera, to implement the same policies within one state. State level openings, for example, Georgia, put too much pressure on vulnerable areas. And we saw that happen last year right here in Georgia. We saw Mayor Van Johnson of Savannah requiring face masks for buildings in Savannah, Georgia, and Governor Kemp saying that wasn't it wasn't going to happen. We saw uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms, our mayor here in Atlanta, implement the same type of mask mandate, and the governor actually sued the mayor and sued the city council over this mandate, showing that there is a huge clash between states and cities. We also had a huge super spreader event, unfortunately, very early on in COVID here in rural Georgia, in Albany, Georgia. And they came out of this saying, hey, you know, we really need a regional task force to help understand and to combat COVID just in our region, not necessarily for the whole state, but not much has come of that. In addition, single cities tend to straddle across states. I'm sure you can think of many. Uh, Kansas City, for example, Cincinnati, Washington, D.C. All of these metropolitan areas can belong to one or more states. And so having state level policy units doesn't make a lot of sense for them. Using states is misaligned with those level, those principles of transmissions because COVID doesn't necessarily know that it's crossing an administrative boundary and doesn't say, hey, 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 I can't go into Maryland. I'm in Virginia. Can't do it. Also, for emergencies, we don't use states, we use counties. So when we have some type of weather emergency, an evacuation for a hurricane, evacuation for a forest fire, wind advisories, flood watch, tornado watch, etc., we know that it doesn't make sense to apply this to a state unit. So we break these down into the county unit that we can better capture where it is and not necessarily apply that whole policy to the entire state. So here's an example of different weather advisories and wind advisories, and we do this at the county level, and it makes a lot of sense. Finally, county packs are possible. You might say, oh, you know, this is too much of an administrative and organizational he headache to do this, but I think that it's worth it. Some uh, exist like the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is an economic development commission, based on a lot of different counties, has nothing to do with state boundaries. Another example is an organ donation. Organ donation used to be at the state level. So looking at if you needed a liver or a liver transplant, they'd say, okay, here's what's available in the state. And they realized, or here's what's available in a clump of states that we called the Southern region. And they realized that there was a big problem, especially in what they call the stroke belt. I learned something new every day down here. Uh, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, they had a lot more uh, organs to donate than they had recipients. 
And so using a new method of with linear algebra and integer programming, they were able to optimize new regions that helped the, um, the organs get transplanted to people who need them. And they did this at the county level as well. So what we're trying to say here is that new regions can be used for implementing stay at home orders, delivering public messaging and capturing cohesive areas. Now let's take a step back and remember who we are as GI scientists, as geographers, as geospatial analysts. And just remember that regionalization has a long legacy in geography. So this is not a new idea to say, hey, let's try to partition different areas. One of our favorite examples here uh, that the AP Human Geography classes learn about in high school is uh, the example of Oh, sorry. Um, the example of Wilbur Zielinski's work on cultural regions in the US and students in AP human geography and in geography classes, human geography classes in college learn about cultural hearths and vernacular regions, which is always really fun. So this is an example of research that went through telephone books. So those big stacks of paper books that we all remember and looked at the frequency in the telephone books of businesses which different vernacular terms were used. For example, Creole, Aztec, Acadia, Pioneer, Pilgrim, Viking, etc. And they found the different parts of the country that tended to use those more than others. For example, in New England, we would tend to use Pilgrim more than Aztec. Over here, we would tend to use Aztec a lot more than Creole. Over here, we would use Creole a lot or Viking in this area and was able to partition these really interesting vernacular regions. We have new data today. This is an example of Facebook, of fa who you, uh, Facebook accounts by county and who they followed. So which baseball team they followed. And we can see that they, we end up getting these little cultural regions around here that, that demarcate where fans are. And clearly it doesn't mean that all fans are just within one county or that everyone in the county follows different or follows the same baseball team, but it is interesting to see the different divides that we have now that we have new data sets. We also look at interaction. So it isn't necessarily what is actually in place, but how things are interacting with each other. And this again is not new either. This is an example of phone calls in Montana and partitioning different regions in 1979 based on the phone calls that were connecting across areas. And today we have even newer methods of doing this and it's extremely exciting. Now that we have big mobility data and larger data sets on social networks that are geolocated from place to place, we can better chop up areas to find these regions that are very cohesive. And this is one of my very, uh, not my paper, of course, but a very exciting paper that came out earlier this year that made some really exciting strides in this, um, in this topic, or at least they did a really good job of explaining it. And what this paper did is it took a look at mobility data and it partitioned different regions and it gave two uh, two examples that I really like here. The first one is that included border thickness. So that means that we have a boundary, for example, this boundary right up here. When you see a thicker line, it means you're a lot less likely to cross between those two regions. It's like a higher wall or a higher fence. And then when you have a thinner line, it means that that boundary was weaker and there was actually a lot of connection. And the main goal with these regions, if I hadn't said it already, is that most of the movement and most of the con connectivity stays within the region and very little of it moves across the region. And this paper even took it a step further to say, you know, why? Why was that border there? And they found that some of them reflected natural borders, like a park or a forest. Others reflected in infrastructural borders, like a highway. And others reflected administrative borders, like different types of different types of provinces or districts. And so they put these together and were able to explain why the partitions were there, which is a great um, which is a great contribution to the normal kind of data mining that we do for this. So let's now turn to what we did in this experiment. So I'm going to give a kind of a graphical summary of our approach here. 
So we wanted to use county to county flows, any county to any county, and we had it for counties in the United States of con connections. So how many migrants go from county, this county to that county? How many Facebook friends are there between the counties? How many Twitter co-mentions? How many um, commuters go there? And how many GPS traces go between these places? And what we did was from there, we derived regions using a, a community detection algorithm. And then what we did was we found, we created a county adjacency matrix and put it right on top of there. And we put the number of COVID cases that existed between these counties. And we wanted to see how well COVID cases, COVID case rates stayed within regions and didn't tend to go across regions. So that was our goal was to find these unique regions and then test to see if they performed better than states at preventing COVID spillovers. So here are the network data sets that we used. Commutes from the LEHD, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics, uh, from the origin destination data set from the census. So we have the number of nodes and number of edges that go between the nodes. We have Facebook data. This is called the Social Connectivity Index. And this is data from Bailey, um, from Michael Bailey and his team at Facebook, who actually measured the number of friendships that exist between each county. We have migrants. So this is from the US American Community Survey, US American Community Survey, right, over a five year period. So we have county to county migration flows. We have GPS traces, so we've got trips, and those were provided by SafeGraph. We have Twitter co-mentions, meaning that you don't necessarily follow each other on Twitter. You don't, you, you, you probably do, but you don't need to, but you've tagged each other before. You've said at this person, at that person. And we use different years for these, depending on the latest year that we were able to get the data set at the time. And we used January, 2020 for the safe graph data, because that was the most recent month that before COVID was really um, putting a damper on the mobility in the United States. And I have stars here for data that is free online. You could download it today, download it today. The Facebook and SafeGraph data, we also got for free from these researchers, but you have to put in that you're using it for academic purposes and describe your work in some cases, in the Facebook case. With the SafeGraph state case, you need to uh, sign an NDA. And with the Twitter co-mentions, we have that from Chalar and that was his uh, data set that he may, may or may not be able to share in the future. So the way we derived regions from this network data is we used community detection algorithm. And I'm going to show you here very briefly what I mean by that. This is an example that I actually use in class. I teach in my spatial networks class of migration. So we just have names. This is not spatial at all. We just have names of different places and they get an edge between them if they send migrants to another city. And then we would use this community detection algorithm that makes this, this network and puts a different community as one different color. If we find that, hey, you know, this is really its own cohesive community in here. That's really its own cohesive community. So the blue community sends a lot of migrants to each other. The red community sends a lot of migrants to each other. And then we take those colors or those groups, et cetera, however you want to think of them, and then we remap them back into an actual map. So say, oh, this, this city here was part of, the, part of the orange district, or this county here is orange over there, therefore it's orange over here. It's blue over here, therefore it's blue over there. And so that's how we get from network partitioning, which is really a physics approach or a mathematical approach, and then remap it. So we implemented this in iGraph mostly, and then we used Python and ArcGIS as well. And we tried out five different community detection methods. There are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of community detection methods, also called mo modularity. Um, well, they're related to the term modularity as well. So we looked at fast greedy InfoMap, the Luvan method, RedCap, and WalkTrap. Of these, REDCap is the only explicitly spatial method, and that's the one that we implemented in Python. We ended up using the Luvan method to create our partitions 
because it ended up with the highest Q score, which is the maximized modularity, meaning that a lot of the flows stay within the module and don't go across the module. And if you're thinking, well, how did you get that module to begin with? It's an iterative process. So you make the module, you test to see if, if flows are staying within it. If not doing a good job, you change the module. There's agglomerative methods, there's divisive methods, there are hierarchical methods. We won't go into that today, but we wanted to share that we did look at different methods for this and we found that the Louvain method had the highest modularity scores and also it present it gave us some reasonable number of partitions and reasonable meaning that they're not too too much different than the 48 states that we were using. For example, the walk chat method giving us 1300 partitions doesn't make a lot of sense that's about two counties 2.5 2.3 counties of partition um, and then trips giving us just one partition for the whole US that doesn't make much sense either that me that method didn't perform very well. So we use the Lubon method. The next thing we do is we have to look at COVID cases on top of the regions, so we make a county adjacency matrix uh, which show which counties are adjacent to each other which counties share a border with each other. And so it ends up looking a little like what geographers would recognize as a tin a triangular regular network, but it's it's a little bit different than that. So we've got our 3100 counties here again we don't use Alaska and Hawaii and then we've got almost 9000 edges between them. Each edge is going to have COVID cases on them, and you'll see this grayed out a little bit throughout my throughout the talk today, and that is because I think that this is a very hand wavy statistic to actually do raw cases. And that's because they're very dependent on the population that's there. And also there's sort of a, a numeric argument why it's a little tricky too, is that if you have a lot of neighbors, your cases get recounted and recounted and recounted because these cases are summed between the two counties. So what I mean by that is that, you know, if there were 8,000 cases in this county, that 8,000 gets reassigned to all of those little spokes that are around that center. And that doesn't make a lot of sense because if you have more boundaries, your, your cases are going to be, you know, re replicated too many times. Then we have the case rate, which I think is a little bit more of a reasonable statistic. That is the sum of the um, that's the sum of the cases divided by the total population. Again, not a great, not a perfect statistic, but a little more reasonable. And then this one here is the case rate difference. And I think that that's really interesting too. And it says, you know, is one of, are one of you high and one of you really low, or vice versa, or are you both high or are you both low in these case rates? And so if we see that there is a big mismatch in the two, we can say, hey, you know, that's a pretty thick border. Those, those case rates weren't similar between those two areas. For some reason, it didn't have the same, COVID didn't have the same effect there. And because we know that it has to do with people traveling, talking to each other, et cetera, especially in the earlier days, we can say that there's some sort of boundary there. We also use three waves here, which, coincide a little bit with uh, school, school, um, the school calendar a bit and college calendar too. And so we use an early wave, January 21st was early um, COVID cases from the New York Times that were found in the state of Washington. Then we have a second wave and then we have a third wave. And these correspond with a couple of journalistic, uh, journalistic pieces that describe these waves as well. And what, what's interesting about COVID research, and I know we've all, a lot of us have been working on COVID related research and you're just constantly updating it uh, as the new cases come in. So we, our cutoff was July 1st, but before that it was January and then it was March and et cetera. And now finally to the statistics. So how do we know if we've got, how do we know if we're right here? How do we know if we found regions that perform more effectively than states? We're looking for two major things and then one minor thing too. We're looking for case rates that are going to be higher within regions and lower between the regions. So we're looking for those case rates to be cohesively high in the middle and then low on the boundaries. We're also looking that case rates differences will be lower within the regions and higher 
between the between the regions. So we find that differential in the case rates. So those are the two things that we're looking for. And then we're also looking a little bit grayer that the cases will be higher within the regions and lower within the regions. So that those cases are kind of staying in there in that little boiling pot and not going across the regions. And please, just to reiterate, we are not using COVID data to create the regions at all. We're just using human network data. So now I'll move on and we'll describe the results. So here were the regions that we came up with. And in our technical report that we'll hopefully be releasing quite soon, we've got some pretty pictures or some, some maps that are have more of kind of the colors on them, et cetera. But these are, these are what the regions look like. So here are the basic statistics of these constructed regions. So as you may have seen before from the table with the Louvain method, we have a range in the number of regions that the community detection algorithm partitioned. So commuters has the most with 75. The Twitter connections uh, have the fewest with 26. And this is a good time for me to also mention that the connections are undirected. So they're not directed connections. It's not A to B doesn't equal B to A. It's mutual, mutual migrants between the two places, mutual trips between the two places, mutual Twitter co-mentions, et cetera. We also have pretty high module Q scores, um, which measure how well the partitions did. We even get into the 90s in some cases here with the commuters and the trips. And then our Twitter regions are don't perform the best meaning that here we found the regions, but there is actually a lot of crossover between those regions. This is the total amount of border in kilometers around the regions. And this, as you would, as you would guess, is correlated very strongly with the number of regions. When you get more regions, you have more border. And then here, this is the number of edges that go between regions and the number of edges that stay within regions. And these all add up to the, each of these add up to the total number of edges that we have in that adjacency network. And so we're comparing a lot in this, in this study of what stays within and what goes between. So it's really important that we explain and we're really transparent about how many edges, how many opportunities are there to, to, to stay within and how many opportunities are there to go between. And this here is a statistic that describe how often are you going to have an edge. So in the trip network, we have an edge every 30 kilometers, but in Twitter network or the state network, we have an edge every 26 kilometers. So those are the summary statistics for the regions. And at the end, we have an interactive tool where you can see them in depth and sort of play around and combine them together. This is a map that I really enjoyed making. So if you overlaid all of those regions together, and you tried to find the boundaries that were the strongest or the weakest, where would those boundaries be? So when you see, a, this is a very common thing to do in, in network science. Um, and what we have here is an agreement rate, meaning that how often are two adjacent counties assigned to the same region or state? So the maximum they could get is six. That means, hey, we're always in the same region and we're in the same state. The minimum they can get is zero. Say we were every time you partitioned us from these different networks, you we ended up in different communities. So when you see this dark red here, it means that these two counties are very good friends. They have a lot of social media ties between them. They have a lot of movement and a lot of migration. When you see something that's yellow or white, it means that it's a lot less. So we see some interesting patterns here. We see that area um, between Missouri and Kansas, you know, where they have the metropolitan area of Kansas City, which really straddles between the two states. We see that there's a very fluid connection here, that they're assigned to the same region often. We see that the Carolinas are assigned to the same region very often. And then areas in Kentucky as well with um, Indiana and then here Cincinnati, for example. You can probably spot these better, even better than I can. Some surprises that I found here were that I didn't realize that Colorado and Utah were so. So we had kind of a segregation there. And then some of these borders with Ohio and Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania. This border really surprised me here between, um, between Pennsylvania and Maryland. And then this one was a big shocker to me. 
Uh, I don't know if you all were are surprised by that as well between Mississippi and Alabama. They didn't end up, they didn't have flows to connect them sufficiently to be in the same region in any case. Meanwhile, between Alabama and Georgia, you do see a lot of connectivity. And that was a kind of a surprise to me as well, because those are two different time zones there. So you're cutting across uh, into central time. And oftentimes that can be a big reason why there is a, dis there is a disconnect. So perhaps you can find your own uh, interesting patterns in here. I will say last that they, you do have more of a connection if you have a highway there as well. And I'd love to hear about them later. I was surprised by this a bit. All right, so let's get to our COVID statistics. And then we will uh, wrap up with some conclusions and some implementation. So here are the statistics that we described. And as I've been saying multiple times, the cases are a little grayed out here. So we'll get to those. We'll get to those. So the the case rate, so these are the number of COVID cases per thousand people within, means that these are the COVID cases that stay within the regions. And we said before that we wanted these to be bigger than to go between. And I'm gonna focus on wave three here because there's just a lot more cases here. And they tend to be a lot, they tend to be bigger for some more than others. So this tends to work out for the regions we derive from commutes. It tends to work out as well for the regions we derive from trips. It doesn't work out as well for the regions we derive from states. It really didn't work out very well from the regions we derive from Facebook. And then the migration ones, et cetera, didn't also didn't really pan out there. And now we have the differences between the COVID rates as well. And we wanted these to be low within and then high between. And this is an absolute value too. This is an absolute value. And so this worked for all of the regions. Every single region, every single type of region, including the states, we had those case differences be small, case rate differences be small when you stayed inside the region, different counties within the region. And then those differences got really big on those boundaries. And this was exciting to see because it meant that those boundaries really meant something. It meant that they did, did produce some sort of barrier where the situation over here is different than the situation over here, but the situation here and here were quite similar. And so that persisted across all of the regions that we partitioned, including the states, which we thought was interesting. The last kind of critical statistic here that's of interest is this odds ratio. So this is the number of cases between versus within divided by the number of edges between versus within. And if you're saying to yourself, oh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of having trouble wrapping my head around that, I, I understand. What it is, is to say, you know, how, what is this, what is the ratio on top normalized by their opportunity, the opportunity to go between versus within. And remember that those splits between and within were a little bit different when you have more or fewer regions in total. So that's why we normalize it there. And we want that number to be low. We want that number to be low. We want it to be, we want it to be, we wanted it to be under 10, but we wanted it to be low. So for the commutes, it's the lowest, the odds ratio. And then we have the trips, which is also quite low. And then the migration in states perform a bit higher. And then our worst performing regions are our Facebook and Twitter regions. And at this point, you might, you might say, well, I could have told you that. I mean, moving around is much more important or much more telling of a disease than social media. We weren't sure how much of an effect that it would have had. And there has been prior research showing that social media really correlates with movement and the role of information transfer and policies in terms of telling each other, oh, hey, I'm not going to wear a mask here or, hey, you know, stay at home or something like that over social media played a huge role, is playing a huge role in the pandemic. And so it is worth testing. Now, let's take a look finally to, to look at if these have some statistical properties as well beyond the summary statistics. So what we did here is we did a permutation analysis. We randomly permuted the betweens and the withins, which for the statistic, we just converted to zeros or ones. So we randomly permuted those. And so it meant we randomly attached a between and a within, just agnostically. So we had this long strip of case rates 
And we said, you're a case rate between, you're a case rate within, you're a case rate within, you're a case rate between. Just like t pulling something out of a hat. And then what we did was we summed the ones in this random distribution 10,000 different times. So we created a nice distribution there. And so that was our distribution of expected sums, expected sum of rates, expected sum of rate differences, and expected sum of cases if things were distributed randomly. Then we compared this distribution to the sum of values of our actual border crossings. And here's what we found. So the maybe the, the cases, what we found here was that the p-value that this would turn out to be different than our actual distribution. This is an example of commutes and cases. It turns out that our actual sum was way, way lower than the, the, the probability distribution that it gave us randomly. So that means that there were way, way fewer cases between the boundaries than was expected by this distribution. Here we have commutes with case rate differences. We found that this was way, way higher. So this corresponds to this zero here and to this one here. And the stars here are, um, are statistics that we might wanna pay more attention to when we convert them into better, to more um, reliable p-values. And here we have an example of something that was much less significant, which is this 0.19 over here. So this is the distribution that was randomly created from the partition from the states. And then this was the actual for the states. So you can see from this that the it didn't necessarily what we had actually fit into something that we could get pretty easily out of random. So that means that the partitions, the state partitions weren't special in that regard. And what we're drawing from this is that there's fewer total cases on the border. There's lower rates on the border for the commutes and the GPS trips, or the GPS traces especially. This Facebook thing worked out very strangely, and I'm not really sure how to explain that just yet. And this rate difference is high for commutes, migrants, Twitter, and states. So the rate difference ended up actually being very important, very a really telling tale uh, for, for COVID spillovers for these type of boundaries. But again, our, our Facebook boundaries were sort of a dud and we don't want to use those for anything. So the statistics here are measured for wave three, just uh, for the sake of time. For future work, we would want to look at maybe some spatial autocorrelation. Uh, we would want to look at some maybe hotspot detection, and we would want to take a look at logistic regression as well. Uh, we, because we have that zero one outcome, it's possible that logistic regression could tell us a little bit more about the situation. So those are the results of our experiment here. And so our conclusions are that we used a large network data set to find well-connected regions. We find that regions based on commuters and movements perform better than states. And you can say, hey, well, you know, Cleo, you just found the cities. And that's true. We found the cities, we found the metro areas, and we, we carved them out. But it does show that they could be very effective in saying, hey, you know, you should you should implement your policies at this level right now, not necessarily at the whole state. These regions tend to lack spillovers of cases, and they tend to be more homogenous in case rates, meaning that this is a good snapshot of how this region is doing right now. We encourage the use of these regions and multi regions, you can put them together to help administer policies for schools and businesses, social distancing, mask mandates, etc. Um, instead, or in addition to using states. So I'd like now to share with you a tool um, that we are very grateful to have. And this tool here, I think we're gonna post the link in the chat in just a minute, uh, so you can play around with it. And it allows you to create your own regions. So you can do it based on the commuter regions. You can do it based on the GPS trips. I know I call those traces and trips interchangeably um, in the migrants or and see how they adhere to states as well. And uh, you can you can create your own. I think we're yeah, let me just pause that and I will I will go ahead and share that with you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. And the way that this works is that we've got these consensus regions here. And I will say that they do flip colors a lot and we are working on that. It's actually a really fun project 
to work at these look at these different colors and how to standardize them. Uh, it brings together a bunch of things that we really like. Um, but you can go ahead and you can put in your own recipe as well. And another update that we're doing is we're making this tooltip a little bit more helpful right now because having a FIPS code isn't necessarily um, isn't necessarily strong as an indicator as the name. Um, so what you're seeing here is that it's adding more of the data in the different and that came from these different networks to repartition these a little more. And you can see too that if you wanted to add states in a little bit more. So these commutes are looking at our metro areas here, but you say, hey, I really want these to follow states. And so as you add more, you get more to that, those state boundaries. Oh, and uh, we just, I, I did conclude already, but uh, I don't know if anyone remembers seeing this fun tidbit of uh, po politics, um, but Oregon, some counties in Oregon were looking to secede and join uh, uh, Greater Iowa. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nope. Iowa's been on my mind a lot right now because of our tool and our collaborator. But uh, Greater Idaho. Greater Idaho. This is a great NPR article about Oregon. Uh, so these di these different counties over here wanted wanted voted to go to Iowa to Idaho. Um, it says that Oregon may be happy to get rid of these low income counties. Um, Idaho may be happy to have these high income counties. This is all cited. This is all cited in the NPR article. Um, and then one county is on said that it was on the fence. It got low votes because Oregon, even though it shares this long border with Idaho here and is close to Boise, um, it's on the fence since Oregon gave them $10 million in tax revenue from marijuana sales. And they don't have that policy in Idaho, uh, so that is that is something that they would have to um, that's that something they have to re remedy with. All right, and uh, we just wanted to have a big big thank you to the Geospatial Fellows Program, and we wanted to thank a couple of people for helping us with this. And um, we will turn it over to Jean Michel. All right, I think I'm unmuted, right? Okay, you hear me? Yes, okay. So, well, one, one advantage of being asked to serve as a, as a discussant of a paper is that you've got to read the paper uh, and maybe other papers in order to minimally understand what the paper is all about. And uh, this was a, a great opportunity for me to learn quite a few new things. So although as retired and emeritus, I'm still eager to learn. And this was a great, great opportunity, uh, particularly the Louvain algorithm. I had no idea that there was a Louvain algorithm somewhere in the world. I knew Louvain, I had been in Louvain, but uh, the algorithm, no. Um, this is a very interesting paper that uh, used this uh, network algorithm by Blondel et al. Uh, to partition US counties, 3,108, into uh, homogenous communities. Um, the, the algorithm is, is a very heuristic, but it, it seems that it's very efficient and certainly can, uh, can deal with extremely large number of nodes. Um, and so, uh, as, as you said, Cleo, you use the five data set, commuting, migration, GPS trips, Facebook, and Twitter. My first set of comments uh, has to do with the data you used, the, the spatial interaction data you used uh, to, to regionalize uh, the US. Um, I definitely feel, I, I would have felt a priori that commuting flows would probably be best because they really represent daily interactions. And so while it's home work type of interactions, 
it probably embodies also a lot of other interactions, probably shopping interaction and so on and so forth. So that such interactions are probably um, the basis of COVID, possible COVID interaction and, and spread. Uh, on the other side, when I look at Twitter and Facebook, my first question, it has always been my first question is, what is the representativity of these databases? And we know, for instance, in the case of Twitter, uh, certainly in politics, that the Twitter population, for instance, is not representative of the larger population. So what, what do these interactions mean in terms of uh, COVID transmission? I don't know, but I'm honestly a little bit skeptical and your results uh, support this skepticism. I would say that the same is probably true with Facebook, though um, I'm on less firm ground on that. When you take a migration, um, we are talking about migration from one county to another, I think over a five year period, right? So I'm not sure that this is really representative of the daily interaction that would underlie COVID interaction. So I, I'm not sure that, that these uh, would be really uh, a very good representation. And I think the results are kind of middling. The GPS trips, uh, I must say, I, I'm not sure of the representativity. You probably know better. Um, one, one could assume that they include both commuting and non-commuting interactions. So in a sense, they might be more representative than commuting flow, but I am not sure uh, uh, what is the, the population that is captured by uh, the, the company that pro provided you the data. So again, I. I, I would have focused naturally on, um, on, uh, on commuting, and I think you, you, did, you did very well and, and you came up with the right results. I'm wondering whether uh, using more detailed data on commuting might improve or modify your results. And now correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we have also commute from the census, commuting data, uh, blog group to blog group or census track to census track. Um, I have some problem with county data in the sense that you may have some county extremely heterogeneous in terms of having maybe some cities and then completely rural areas surrounding. And, and uh, for instance, that's the case in Ohio where you have uh, small towns that are classified as metropolitan areas, Lima, uh, Newark, uh, Marion, et cetera, or all these little towns along the Ohio River. Um, but they are really surrounded by a complete rural interland. So my feeling is that maybe if you try to use more detailed commuting data, you might be able to capture more, a more refined partition uh, that, that would better reflect clusters of COVID. So that's, that's one first set of, um, of comments. My second set of comments is that your, your research uh, led me to read the paper by uh, Blondel et al, the, the Louvain method. And, and of course, they, uh, they tested their, I mean, they used um, um, cell, cell phone interactions to build their network. And then they, um, they tested their partition in terms of how well uh, it represented the linguistic, linguistic homogeneity, uh, uh, Dutch versus French versus other language, but it's mostly. Uh, Dutch versus French. Um, so 
that made me think of my, my earlier research in, in telecommunication. And uh, you, you may be aware of that, but in the, from the 60s to the early 80s, and this was a good time for telecommunication research because data were made available uh, much more than they are today in my view. And some people developed different methods to regionalize various areas. So I, um, I, I, I remember, for instance, uh, some people, uh, Nistuen and Daisy in 1961, wrote a paper, I think in the papers of regional science uh, on using graph theory and use, looking at uh, dominant links, telecommunication, telephone links. We are talking about, of course, telephone at that time. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really a dinosaur area, uh, era. But uh, they use this data, for instance, in the state of Washington, other people, Ditworks and Weaver, used also graph theory to analyze, to partition the Netherlands, Clayton to partition Massachusetts. So that was one set of methods. Another set was using Markov chain. Uh, for instance, Hearst applied that to Tanzania, um, Ditworks and Weaver also to the Netherlands, and also factor analysis, principal component analysis. To, uh, to create this regionalization, for instance, Hillary and Peterson uh, for Denmark and Clark for Wales. So uh, these, of course, um, maybe uh, these, these methods, maybe, I'm not sure, would be difficult to implement, but I'm not even sure of that, with an extremely large data set when we are talking about uh, tens of millions or maybe billions of nodes. But, but in your case, where you have uh, 3,000 plus counties, um, I'm kind of wondering whether these methods might uncover uh, partitions that might be useful. Um, we, we tend to forget older methods in favor of the more recent ones, but a possible area of research would be really to compare some of these older regionalization methods with the more recent ones that uh, you've been using. So that, that's my second set of comments. My third one, uh, and the last one, uh, was about the, the COVID measure, the CRW versus CRB. I, I was wondering whether some measures, you know, based on ideas of cluster analysis might also be considered. Uh, I, was, I was thinking, for instance, if you have a given community, let's say you, you've created a community, and that community is made of several counties, and for each county you have uh, a, a, a case rate, right? You might uh, compute the average case rate for your community across all the counties within it, and then maybe look at the relative deviation uh, and, and for, for each county and sum them up, coming up with one integrated measure for each community. And, and then maybe look, looking then, let's call it D for, for a given community. So then if you have two community I and J, you might look at the difference in absolute term between the two communities and maybe use that as an indicator. Essentially, the idea is always internal measure versus uh, inter-region measure. So uh, that was uh, just a suggestion that I'm curious. Uh, I would be curious to know how, how maybe alternative measures might work uh, in terms of assessing the partitions. So that's essentially uh, all what I wanted to say. Uh, this is very good work. And uh, I, I want to encourage you to continue. It's very interesting. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to learn something new. Thank you. Thanks so much for your really insightful comments. And um, one thing I don't agree with is the dinosaur aspect, because all of this stuff was, <laughs> was founded on uh, a lot of the, the work in the 60s uh, based on, yeah. you know, the, re the regional science and the network stuff. And right. so 
So we are very, very appreciative to have your input on that. And thank you again for the ideas to improve the paper. Thank you. Um, I, I'm excited now to see that, which should have been obvious to me at the beginning, was to do actually the statistics per region and see how, whether or not they're actually different than just looking at the crossings. And that would yeah. make some very interesting spatial, um, spatial maps and also some, some interesting cultural questions too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to see if any of my, we have some Q and A here. Um, and if any of my, my colleagues um, wanted to chime in or anything like that. I don't want to put them on the spot, but I also don't want to put them in. All right. Should we, on? should we take some questions? Yes. Yes, I was trying to admit myself. Yeah, uh, Cleo, I think we should definitely take some questions. I think there were a number of questions in Q&A. Maybe you can address some of them. Um, and then I guess we can go from there and ask other questions. I think there were eight questions, so we have plenty. So you can choose yours, uh, the ones you want to handle. I will go ahead and take the first one. Um, Arthi, hi. Yeah, the, I, I, I have seen some some of that, especially at the state level, and especially last year. I don't know if they've kept up with that. Um, I think I found them through a Google search. Um, and that question is, if we're aware of any data sets that document COVID restrictions. And I have seen some research, lot, actually a number of papers that, um, that correlate, correlate those two things. Okay. Um, all right, Marco, should we do you next? What about edge effects with Mexico and Canada? Given that you wouldn't have the same data sets, but for, yeah, that's a great question. Um, redefine the thickness and the thinness with Mexico and Canada. I think that's a, an important thing to, to think about, especially when they did close some of the borders and change some of the borders. Um, and again, if, um, Mason or Tyler, just interrupt me at any any time. I don't I don't have any any knowledge on that right now, but I think it's a good question. Based on what we're taking account, okay, great. All right, Shun. Um, based on what you're taking account into account, why do these keep going away? Yeah. Do they disappear? <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, your colleague answered the question, so it it disappeared. So when they answer it, uh, there, yeah. Sorry, I was I, I, I was <laughs> typing in. <laughs> I didn't know it was gonna go away. Um, yeah, it's in the. It, it, it's in the. Yeah, it's in the answer tab. Just if you want to look at it, Leo. Um. Okay, Joseph. Quick question: What was the temporal extent of the safe graph data? So we have it for January 2020. Um, they have it actually. I think the the spatial extent of it is block group. And then it will go to a point. Um, so it's actually pretty incredible data. If you're asking like if it's every hour um, or not, I forget. I forget what that was. Um, but but we but there the safe graph data has just been really phenomenal. They have a huge huge research network, and they've got it. We we used it for January 2020, but they have it different days of the week, at least at least different days of the week and, and every day. Okay. Um, I'll go here to Mei Feng. Could I explain more about how to evaluate the results of the community detection algorithms? What is and how to calculate maximized modularity in the study? All right. I luckily have, I luckily have a slide for that. Okay, so I thought that there might be a couple of a couple of questions on this community detection stuff, and this is a this is an old an old uh, project that we did back in 2010 with British Telecom and chopping up those regions and and that type of thing based on telephone calls. And so it just shows that there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, how do we evaluate the results of community detection? So. Um, what we have right now is we have a Q value, and there are different ways to do this. 
This is an example of the equation down here. What it is looking at is it's summarizing the potential interactions with the actual interactions. And then you have what's here, like a Kronecker's delta on the end, which is saying, are you in a region or are you in not the region? So, and then this is another way to evaluate how well your communities do after after you participate in them. And I'm realizing now that when you put equations on, you definitely need to put what each of the symbols mean here. Um, but what these are both doing, what these are both doing in theory is that they are taking the number that are staying within the same region and then looking at the number that go outside the region or outside the partition and comparing the two. And so they want a lot of those connections to stay within the region and very few of them to go across the region. So that is how we evaluate the results of these methods. Um, and we can explain a little bit more when our paper comes out pretty soon. The, the, just a preprint, not an actual. Um, and then these are also some, some questions about you know, spatial networks as, or the modularity of values as well. Um, they don't have to be spatially continuous. Ours ended up being mostly spatially contiguous. Um, we didn't ask them to have a certain number of modules. And then here we ask a little bit more. Um, we, we talk a little bit more about, about how that's actually computed. And I realized I put up a slide with too many questions. So I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop share. Okay, who wants to take another one? All right, um, thoughts on census tract as a unit for the regions. Hi, Dev. Um, that would be interesting. I think that it would be a little bit of an administrative nightmare to say, hey, this census tract belongs there, this census tract doesn't, especially because a lot of us don't, don't stop and start. We don't know where the census tracts stop and start, but we tend to know the counties and the counties tend to have their own governments. Um, but you know, you do have these giant counties out in California, for example, and on other places in the West where the county is too big. Uh, so having a smaller unit of analysis would be better. And Los Angeles County and, and the San Francisco Bay Area, they all put out sub-county levels of COVID rates on their own websites. And it was really, really impressive so they didn't have to rely on that one county measure because LA County, you know, has 8 million people in it. Um, but that's a good question too. All right, it seems, uh, Daniel, hi. It seems like some state boundaries like the Wisconsin, Illinois one near where you live, yes, um, matter more than others like the Wisconsin, Indiana border, also near, near where you live. Um, have you noticed any patterns in these differences? Should we go back, go back and take a look at that? Um, what's the Wisconsin Indiana border? You know, see there. Can we promote you, yeah. Daniel? I can't do it. It's not letting me for some reason. Yes, let me promote Daniel Block to the panelist. Hi, this is Danny. Um, I meant with I meant Illinois, Indiana. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so the okay. metro area includes both Kenosha County and Wisconsin, and and and, and Lake and Puerto counties in Indiana. But uh, and certainly, there's lots of folks crossing that you know between Milwaukee and Chicago all the time. But that Wisconsin border, it's always seemed to me to be as well just very definite, you know. <laughs> Um, and and that showed up here, and I, I was wondering if you had any ideas, not just about that, but about certain. Yeah, borders. I think you're talking about right in, right in here. Yeah, yeah, and certain metropolitan borders uh, seem to show up really strongly, like uh, or like 
Louisville or Cincinnati seems crossover, but, um, you know, either Kansas City as well, but like St. Louis, not as much, even though the St. Louis area definitely includes Illinois. It, I, I was just wondering if you had thought about any possible patterns like that. I don't know. I can't. I'm not sure. I mean, I've looked at this map quite a bit, and I'm realizing now that that it would be good for other people to, for me to have labeled this um, a little bit better. But I, I don't know. Yeah, it's really I, interesting. I, I saw some surprises on here. Thanks. A lot of state rivalries for some reason too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. But it's a great question. And I was surprised by that by that as well. Um, okay, and then splanty spatial autocorrelation analysis. Um, I we are thinking about that. We don't know right now. Um, what it would be, I think would be a neighbor of neighbor. Um, this is from Marco. It's a great question on how to use spatial autocorrelation analysis. So instead of just using one level of adjacency, uh, you would use two levels of adjacency. So very simple. So a friend of a friend, um, instead of just sharing that border. <clears throat> um, but it's a very, it's, it's something that we should do, but we're not exactly sure how to do it. One big problem with the with COVID data is that you don't know, you don't have any transmission statistics on it from place to place. We looked into some phylogenetic kind of stuff to say, oh, when did it mutate, et cetera, from seroprevalence data? And that didn't give us a clear answer either. But if we had more of those transmission patterns, this would this would be a lot easier to implement the spatial autocorrelation stuff. So we're thinking about it, but we're not sure. But it's a great question. Um, looks like Marco just raised his hand. Um, let's unmute him. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, fantastic talk and fantastic follow-up uh, commentary. I've learned so much and I've been waiting to see something like this for such a long time. I am so excited about what you come up with. Um, I, and it just brought all these questions about you know, how to implement it. And uh, so I was curious about the spatial autocorrelation question. Um, so I was wondering if you were just going to, one possibility is just to kind of find other regions via, you know, high, high, low, low type of um, local Moran or hotspot analysis type of thing and how, and, and how that could kind of relate to that. That was one train of thought that I thought that's where you were going uh, besides, you know, defining the connectivity or the adjacency or the weight matrix in, in any particular way, Rook queen sort of type of connectivity. But the other one is we also mentioned, you also mentioned uh, logistic regression. And I was wondering if you were thinking about using a spatially autocorrelated adjusted spatial uh, logistic regression, like, like, like the a linear sort of regression for interval ratio dependent variables have their sort of spatial autocorrelation, uh, spatial autoregressive uh, counterparts to incorporate the spatial autocorrelation in the data itself. So um, that those those were just thoughts about you know how that would be implemented, um, but um, but yeah, I guess it's just food for thought more than than because you're thinking about it, but you still I, I guess you still haven't thought about it very much yet. But uh, it's it's um, it's great, it's great, and I encourage you to keep going. Um, if I may also ask an additional question now that I have the mic, um, what about hierarchical interactions, sort of, um, if, for example, New York to LA, they're not contiguous, they're not spatially adjacent, but a lot of disease modeling is also done via sort of, uh, sort of mounting themselves or piggybacking on urban hierarchy studies where interactions are stronger between larger cities that may not be close to each other. Um, so how does that re redefine your regions and your sort of planning for um, containment sort of strategies. Uh, I was just wondering how would that play out? Uh, and I'll shut up right now because I'm taking over. Thanks. 
No, um, well, th thank you. Thank you. Um, and regarding your second question, you're absolutely right. Um, in the migration data set, for example, the strongest connection there is between New York and Miami. So having that, ha having those cross um, the flows that go that that go to coasts, et cetera, it makes perfect sense. There's there's two issues that we ran, run into there, and actually, I think that Chowder can can chime into the the some of the algorithms did put those in in the same bin. Um, not often, but it happened. But I, the problem is that we're having trouble following the COVID the COVID cases. So, for example, if we knew the transmission statistics between non-adjacent, non-adjacent places, and we said, "Oh, hey, you know, it cropped up here," and but we know that people traveled, and that's why it cropped up there, then we would be on much firmer ground than this more impoverished thing that we have to do, which is like, "Okay, we know your neighbors, we know some people went across there because that's how you know space works," and just uh, assuming. That they that a similar case rate meant that there is a lot of transmission. So in culturally, the way people act, the flights, the movement, all of that, it's it, theoretically you're outright, you're spot on. That is how it works. We just don't have that um, dependent variable to corroborate to corroborate it. That's my opinion anyway. Thank you. Cleo, I maybe guess- I'm, Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> no, Cleo, I guess this has been great. Great, I guess. What what you have presented today is uh, really uh, eye-opening and you have done a really good job with, uh, um, with this webinar. And also uh, John Michael with his uh, very thoughtful and insightful comments afterwards. That was um, really good follow-up and a detailed uh, discussion. Um, so I would want to close off the webinar. If you have any qu questions to take immediately uh, or anything that you want to say, that would be good. Uh, otherwise, we'll close off the formal webinar but, and then like let our uh, attendees, if they want to join us, we'll stay here as if like we are in a, uh, in a physical webinar place where we adjourn and people stay along for tea break or something. So we'll do that virtually today. Um, so any of you who are in the uh, attendees uh, might want to join in, can stay, and we'll promote you to panelists. But before that, Cleo, do you want? Do you have any uh, final thoughts that you want to conclude with? Thank you so much, and uh, tune in to. We've got one more, right? We do one have more one seminar? more. Yes, we do have one more webinar in two weeks. Uh, we have Peter and um, Joe Holler uh, who will be doing. Uh, this webinar on mainly on reproducibility. So looking at the things from a reproducibility angle, which would be great. And thank you so much to, to you all and to Jean-Michel, your guest of honor today. And we really, really appreciate it. Yes, we do. Yeah. We do. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll formally uh, stop the, rec uh, the webinar and the recording and we'll let uh, all of the, the attendees join as panelists. Uh, Julati, can you help with that? Yes, absolutely.